Hi, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today is part four of our shed building series where we are going to frame out the roof, finish off the siding, and trim out the whole shed. This particular one might be a little deceptive. It's actually really big. It's a 10 by 16 with nine foot sidewalls, 12 feet of clearance on the inside, and it's got a seven foot door. Uh, but these principles apply to any shed you want to build. All sizes build exactly the same way. The purpose of this shed building series is to give you an exact step-by-step -step tutorial so that you can build any size shed that you want. I will be following the International Building Code Rules or IBC codes for building this shed and pretty much all jurisdictions in the US follow these rules. My purpose is to make this tutorial easy enough to follow even for someone who has no building experience and the project is designed so that it can be done with a minimum number of tools. All you really need is a circular saw, a drill, a hammer, and some basic hand tools and you can accomplish this project. We're going to pick up right where we left off last time and begin by installing the roof trusses. Taking a scrap board like this 2x6 and mounting this to the side of the shed with some screws will allow us to attach it to the first roof truss so that it doesn't tend to wobble or fall over. We want to make sure that it's level so it's going right up to the middle of the truss. Now since we have siding on the outside of the building there, uh, the truss needs to go up to the edge of the framework but not the siding. So I've got to little, put a little piece of siding on the front of this support here to space the truss back by the appropriate thickness. And then they can hand up the first truss and attach it and we'll get going from there. If you can recall from earlier in the shed building series, the two gable end trusses only have the plywood gusset on the inside. They don't have gussets on both sides. And we'll take this truss and we'll back it all the way up to the edge of the framework. And we'll pre-drill a couple of holes in order to put some long screws in to hold this securely in place. You could also toenail that. Sometimes you find it a little bit easier if you're standing on a ladder to put this in with some screws, but the choice is yours there. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. Now remember this truss does not go over the siding. It goes just before the siding, so over the framework, but not over the siding. And we'll just attach it the same way. I did mean over the siding at the end of the shed. On the side of the shed where the truss overhangs, that of course has to go over the siding. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll stop a screw part way through on one side uh, because if you drive it all the way in, it'll tend to shift the truss. But if we stop part way through, then put the screw on the second side, then we can come back and secure the screw on the first side and the truss won't be tempted to slide one way or the other. Now we're just going to repeat that same procedure on the other gable end of the roof here. And same thing, this uh, the gable end truss, remember, just has one plywood gusset on it and this support piece we have up there does have a piece of siding on the inside in order to offset the truss back by the right distance. And we'll secure that truss into that temporary support as well, into, as, well as into both sides going down into the top plates. Now Maya is going to mark out for us where these studs appear uh, on the top plate. We'll transfer the location of those up the side of the top plates and across the top of the top plates because we want the trusses themselves to actually be directly over the studs. That way we have direct load bearing all the way down to the ground and the top plates would never tend to bend or flex assuming uh, they end up getting under heavy load for a deep snow or something like that. It's just traditional to put these directly over the studs. 
If you're considering building a shed for your backyard, we do have a comprehensive set of plans in all of the popular shed sizes that detail step-by-step -step everything you need to do and all the calculations are done for you. You don't have to do or remember any of that. All the angles for the roof trusses and stuff are done for each of those sizes. And it comes with a complete parts list, materials list, everything, uh, and you're ready to go. And there's a link to the plans in the description below. I'd also like to take a moment to ask that if you enjoy watching our videos that you take a moment to hit the subscribe button down below. By clicking on that, that helps our channel grow and that's really the only way the channel grows is if we can build more subscribers. So I'd really appreciate it if you could do that for us. Before we install these intermediate trusses, there's an important thing we need to tackle here and that is to run a string line across the tops of these two gable end trusses. It'll need to go right at the very peak of the truss on each side. And then when we put all of the intermediate trusses in place, we're going to line them up at the point right on this string line. And that way our roof line, the center line, is dead straight all the way across. You might also remember that the truss itself is just a, the bird's mouth cuts are just a tiny bit wider than they actually need to be. So the truss has the ability to slide back and forth just a little bit in order to allow us to get this center line to line up just right and it kind of accounts for any deviations that might be there and allows us to get a perfectly straight roof line. Then we're ready to rotate the next truss up into place. We'll get it lined up with the center line. A little hard to see on the video there, but we do have it lined up directly on our string line. And the next truss, along with all the remaining trusses, will have a plywood gusset on both sides. Once we've established the center line there, then we'll go ahead and toenail this truss down to the top plate with just one toenail on each side, or each side of the truss that is, and of course, on each side of the truss on top of the building. Here Maya is putting a temporary board in. This is just a long two by six that extends the length of our shed. And she's just gonna put one screw into each of these, uh, the tops of these trusses and it's just on one side. And what this will do is it'll actually hold the truss very rigidly in place so that we can safely walk on top of the plywood up top when we go to install the roof itself. Uh, it prevents these things from falling over, although the toenails do hold them in fairly strong. This is just one more little measure of security and safety uh, when building the shed. And you can see once again, we're making sure that the point of the truss falls right in line with that string line. And Cy here is toenailing this one in. Then they'll pass the nail gun across to the other side and Maya will toenail her side in. And you can see from down below here that the trusses themselves are directly over the studs, which is what gives the shed the maximum amount of strength to the roof. And now we're going to put these hurricane ties on. We can, uh, we're going to put these in with joist hanger nails and you could drive them in with a hammer. Or if you have a palm nailer, it makes it really fast and easy. Palm nailer is just a little pneumatic tool that's got uh, a magnet on one side and holds that nail securely and as you push it drives the nail in for you. Makes things go really fast and easy and it's very convenient in awkward tight spaces where you might have difficulty getting a hammer. These hurricane ties really give the roof a lot of structural rigidity and of course they'll prevent the roof from getting ripped off in the event of extremely high winds. And as Maya is working her way down the line by installing more trusses, each time she will secure the truss to that temporary board that we have there on the left. And once we have all of them in and we begin putting our plywood on the right hand side first, once the, the plywood on the right is done, we'll go ahead and pull that temporary board off. I'd like to give a shout out and say hi to the members of our King's Fine Woodworking community. We have a, a community on Facebook. Uh, if you're interested and you do woodworking and you'd be interested in joining, you can check us out. I have a link to that in the description below. It's a, a great place where woodworkers can connect with other woodworkers and you can share your work and get help if needed. With the trusses complete, we can remove these temporary braces that we used to help us get the first two trusses aligned.
and we no longer need the string line in place either. All right, now we have a little preview of where we are at thus far in the build. It's finally starting to look a little bit more like a shed here. Now we need to turn our attention to the rim, which is going to tie the edge of these trusses together. It's important to note that this rim does not go flush with the top of the truss, the rafter on the truss itself. It has to be down so that if our plywood goes over the top of the truss, it will just kiss the top outside corner of the rim. So we have a straight edge there, which is what Sai was using to give us the correct elevation of this rim board and you can see how that works. And we'll check that at each of the trusses all the way down and make sure that uh, where the rafter is nailed in that the rim is at the correct elevation. We'll check elevation, we'll nail it, we'll move to the next one and so on. And then we'll come back and nail the bottoms of them. After that, we're going to need to put a board against the shed itself that's going to hold the soffit. The outer part of the rim is going to hold the front part of the soffit, and we'll need a board against the shed to hold the back part. And it's important that these two are level with one another, so Sai is leveling that there while she nails in this back support board that helps carry the soffit. Now the back support board is just a 2x4 and it can be put in several pieces. It does not need to be one continuous piece. You can also put it in by just using a square and getting it up to the right elevation there. Now, soffit is basically going to go from the front to the back there and you can see the soffit is starting to go into place. Now we'll cut the soffit, we'll basically rip that from pieces of the siding. We'll measure whatever the width that is and we'll just cut these soffit pieces in strips and nail them up. Of course it looks nice if we can line up the seam lines with the shed siding down below. Then we'll just continue in this fashion overlapping the siding for the soffit in the same exact way we overlapped the siding for the outside of the shed itself and put this all the way to the end of the shed. We'll actually follow the same nailing schedule that we did for the siding itself and since these are both outside edges we'll put nails about every six inches all the way down. After that we'll put up our fascia and our fascia is a piece of one by six siding trim and it's going to go on top of our rim board and it's actually going to come down over the edge of that soffit that we just put. And if you see how we are setting this up here you will note that it also does not come flush with the top of the rim board. It's got to be offset downward so that the roofing itself goes directly over the top of that and we can establish that by using a straight edge or a square to make sure that it's offset downward by the appropriate amount. We will also continue checking the elevation of that fascia all the way down as we install the nails. With that complete we will turn our attention to the little bits of siding at the corner which will seal up this roof overhang. So we'll just take a piece of siding, we'll put it up in place, and we're going to trace it. Uh, we could take some measurements, but it's really easy just to take a little piece of siding up here and, uh, and trace it, and we'll take that down and cut it out. We do want to make sure that it's in the right orientation and that the correct overlap is there from the siding that already existed on the sides of the wall before. And that's not too hard to do. Once we have that done, we'll just take it down We'll cut it out and then we can install it.
we just basically put one nail at each of the four corners for this. And we did the same at all four corners of the building. The next step is to put in the gable end studs. What Maya is doing is using a level to establish a plumb line from the stud that's down below in the wall directly up to the top of this rafter. This way we have a continual stud from the bottom all the way to the top and our seam lines on the siding can be the same from the bottom all the way up top and our nailing schedule can remain the same as well. Here's another situation where I think it's just a little bit easier to trace than it is to measure. Both methods are of course acceptable, but if you've got a person working up high and a person down low, it's real easy just to hand up a short stud, short piece of 2x4, have somebody trace it, pass that back down and cut it, then pass it right back up again. Maya has traced it, she's passed it down to me and I'm cutting it. And the next thing I'm going to do is to pre-drill some holes for some screws. We could toenail this in, but in some areas it gets a little bit cramped, so I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill it in order to install some screws. I think that makes it a little bit easier, maybe a tiny bit more time consuming, uh, but it's just a little bit easier to assemble it up top. It's also important to note that we have rotated these studs, the gable end studs, 90 degrees to the studs that were down below in the shed. And this is just so that they line up perfectly with the truss up top. We'll just continue in the same fashion using our scrap 2x4 pieces until we knock out all the gable end studs on this side. There's probably six or seven of them, something like that. It's not too tedious. Uh, she's putting in one of the ones right at the end here. This is one that's practically impossible to toenail in. In fact, she's got to use a right angle attachment with the drill even to get that in because it's a sort of a tight fit. Could have avoided that, but if you have the device, it's good to go ahead and use it. With those installed, we'll do the siding, which isn't hard. We know the full width of the siding here is four feet. There, Maya's gonna measure from the edge of the siding to the top, and Sai's gonna measure from the other edge of the siding to the top and call out measurements. And then I'll take those into the shop. I'll transfer those to a piece of siding itself. We'll snap a chalk line and we'll cut it. When you're cutting these, it's pretty easy just to make them about a quarter of an inch shorter than what they really need to be. Uh, that way you've got some flexibility there in case you accidentally cut a little bit too long. It doesn't stick over the top of your roof line. And it's not really a problem because when we put the roof line flashing over the top of this, it's going to hang down by a couple of inches and it'll hide that little bit of a gap 100%. One last thing before installing this top portion of siding. If you remember on the walls of the building itself, we had to put a little bit of flashing between the two elevations of siding so that water doesn't get in through that joint. And we've got to do the same thing here. There's no difference. We've got to put this down and we'll just hold it in place. Uh, it's called Z flashing. We'll just hold this in place and we'll put the siding right over the top of it. That way if water gets in there, it's not going to run uphill and over the flashing and back inside the shed. So it'll help keep our shed watertight. Another thing we like to do is to make sure that the vertical lines of the siding are continuous from the lower portion all the way up to the top. And we'll just follow the same nailing schedule here. They'll be six inches apart around the perimeter and we'll put them in the middle about every 12 inches or so. Uh, if there's a shorter distance, we'll put them a little closer together than that, but that's enough to get this held securely in place. Now we'll measure the next piece of siding. There's a couple of more steps here to make sure that we get this one right. We need to make sure that we have a plumb line established, which is what the level is for that goes from the very peak dead center of the building right down. And we'll kind of check the measurement, you know, top, middle, and bottom, make sure that it's uh, the same distance in each situation. And then we'll record that distance so we can transfer that to the siding inside. And now we'll have three vertical measurements instead of the two What's like that? the previous piece. One of the measurements okay. is going to be where it attaches to the siding uh, that's already there. The other is going to be the total peak height. 
Okay. And the final one is going to be at the other end of the four foot width of siding. And we can just see from down below where that piece of siding ends. And we'll get the altitude of that piece there. And now we can take these measurements into the shop and cut this out. First I'll mark the height where it attaches to the other siding. And you'll notice I'm marking it a little ways back from the edge. That's because this siding has overlap by about half of an inch there so I'm marking it in some and then I'll measure over to get the peak that's where my peak height is and we'll need to kind of establish a straight line down which shows where my peaks at and then we'll need to get the height of my peak which we measured from outside and now we can draw our line from the peak and down to that first height measurement And at the other end of the four foot wide siding, we have the last elevation that we took. And this one will measure right at the edge of the siding as opposed to three quarters of an inch in because this is the underside of the lip portion. And we can snap a chalk line here because that's a little bit too long for my straight edge. And we'll just cut this piece out. I'm going to do the same thing here when I actually measured it. I, I measured it just a little bit short of the actual elevation that we needed. So it'll come just below the top and that'll give me a little bit of room for error and we don't have to worry about it because the flashing that goes over the top of the roof and down over the top edge of the building is going to extend quite a ways past this so it's not going to be seen. Then we'll just install this piece with the same nailing schedule as before. Now that we've reached the other end, it's the same situation. We've got two elevations, the one touching the siding and the one at the other side. We'll get those, we'll transfer that to our board, take it inside, cut it, and we'll be able to go put that up. Now we can just put it in place and I hope by me going over all these things in excruciating detail that that wasn't too boring for everybody. I just kind of wanted to point out some of the techniques and methods because I know not everybody out there understands exactly where and how to measure in order to get these cuts to line up and it can be a little intimidating if you've never done it before. So from this point, the next step is to finish up the trim. We've got the fascia trim on the two sides, and now we need to finish the trim that goes on the gable end. For this trim, we're just going to measure the peak down to each edge on both sides, and it should be the same. And we'll take those measurements, and we've got our, our center point here. And what we have to do is just rotate this over to seven, because this is a 712 pitch roof. You'll find that everything on the shed is really easy if you do it this way. But we've got a 712 pitch and we'll just draw our line and we'll do the same thing for the siding or the fascia trim on the other side. Then we'll just cut those out and we can install them.
We like to do a quick check, put them both up together and hold them up with some clamps just to make sure that our seams fit perfectly, especially since this is the front of the shed and this is the part that people are gonna see immediately. Uh, we wanna make sure that it looks the best. And clamps are definitely your friend if you are working by yourself. They're great to hold on end while you hold the other end and nail, especially for long pieces of wood. You might have noticed throughout the build little white spots appearing here and there uh, and along some seam lines. We like to fill all of that as we go. I like to fill the nail heads uh, with a latex paintable caulk and any obvious seams. That way when we paint over it, it just looks nice and smooth and there's no obvious sign of error in the building itself and it helps to make it a little bit more watertight as well. Now we're down to the vertical pieces of trim on the four corners of the building. I like to put the trim on the sides of the building first, and then we'll do on the front and back of the building second. So we'll measure it, cut it, and put it up in place. And then it's important to take a speed square or a straight edge and make sure that the siding lines up perfectly flush with the front edge of the building. There will always be some small gaps in the siding that's attached to the building itself down below this trim because that siding just went to the edge of the 2x4 wall. It didn't extend over the edge of the other piece of siding, so they're both offset back by just a little bit. That's normal. That's part of this method of construction, but that's okay. That gets completely hidden by this trim. And we'll just check periodically as we nail this thing in going down the building to make sure that we maintain flushness with the front of the building itself. Now we're ready to measure for the trim on the front. If we pay attention to this line, this corner edge of the trim here and follow that straight up, that's the edge that we want to measure our height to because this front trim is going to go over the side trim. So we'll measure from there down to the bottom. And this measurement is to the short of that angle. And that angle, of course, is our 712 slope. So we'll make sure that we have the correct edge of this siding facing forward, the rough edge. And we can tell we put our pivot point here and rotate over to our 712. And we can see now if we draw our line that this is the sightings in the correct orientation to go on the right side of our building. We want to follow the same procedure here. We want to use a speed square or a straight edge to make sure that this piece of trim comes perfectly flush with the other piece of trim on the right side of the building. That way we have a full three quarter inch overlap of the two pieces of trim and any gap on the siding down below is 100% hidden and sealed watertight. We also want to make sure that we follow this flush measurement all the way down to the bottom as we're nailing it in. With that, today's part of the build is wrapped up. You can see the building has been completed to the stage where all the trim is in place, the roof trusses are in place and it'll be ready for a final finish in our next video. I hope to see you then. Thanks for watching.